Welcome to the sixth annual field report. This is the sixth one. That's quite amazing. Um, I always thought it was really worth starting one of these. Um, all right. So, oh, the first slide I always have is please consider donating uh, at DickinsonMuseumCenter.com if you like what you see or you want to support our programming. Um, we have lots of different things that can be donated to the history side as well, of course, not just all fossils. Okay, so a little outline of what I'm going to do, uh, just an introduction to um, some of the people, the faces that you'll see. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, stuff that's been going on back in the museum, um, paleo stuff. Um, and then we'll talk about the discoveries from the field work, and that'll probably take about 45 minutes. Uh, although I haven't timed this, so we'll see. Um, and that point we'll switch over to the live camera and people will be able to ask questions and um, we'll show off some of these fossils live on camera, that sort of thing. So this is uh, all the people you'll be hearing from a little bit. Um, so there's me in the top left corner. I'm Dr. Denver Fowler. So I'm the curator here at Badlands Dinosaur Museum in Dickinson, North Dakota. I've been here since 2016. Uh, top right is my wife, Dr. Elizabeth Friedman Fowler. She is an expert on duck-billed dinosaurs. So she's holding up a picture of a duck-bill uh, that she described a few years ago. Uh, in the bottom left, Amanda Hendricks uh, will be with us a little bit later on. She's our new educator and collections manager. She started in January 2022. Uh, Joel was our intern this summer. He's not in on this podcast or whatever it's called, broadcast. Um, and then Steve Clawson in the bottom right, he is the preparator and has been cleaning up loads of the fossils that you'll see and is doing a fantastic job in the lab. And he's looking lovingly at uh, a tail section from one of our tyrannosaurs in that photograph. So you'll see, you'll see them and you'll certainly hear from most of them a little bit later on. So what's going on in the Badlands Dinosaur Museum? Um, we got a new big 3D printer this year um, that was donated by Greg Nisius. Um, so that's really increased our capacity for doing 3D printing. Um, which is really how a lot of exhibits are going these days. Um, so we have a lot of projects to do with 3D printing. Um, if you saw last year's presentation, you'll have seen this Count Tricular Triceratops. It was missing about one third of the frill. So we 3D scanned um, the, re the remaining part, mirrored it in the software, and then 3D printed out the part. And it's just been finished being painted. Um, so Amanda finished that off, Liz started it and Amanda finished it. And so the exhibit is ready for an exhibit panel. So that's something I've got to do, um, but uh, it looks really nice. So we're really pleased with that. And um, the big printer has allowed us to finish a couple of things. Um, the big pteranodon, you can see in the uh, top part of the screen. I've got to hang that from the ceiling somewhere in the museum, but we have a full size pteranodon printed and ready to go. And, uh, and then we recently 3D printed a full-size Ankylosaurus skull. Now, <clears throat> I don't really want a museum full of 3D prints, um, but these two specimens are quite unusual, I suppose. Ankylosaurus is only known from three good skulls, and two of those are at the American Museum, the other one's at the Canadian Museum of Nature. So unless you go to those museums, then if you see an Ankylosaurus skull, it is a cast of one of those skulls. So we want to have an Ankylosaurus, because it's one of the dinosaurs that lived here in Dickinson. And the pteranodon, they're always squashed flat and they're not very complete usually as well. So if you see a pteranodon hanging up at an airport or something, it is also a cast. Or a sculpture, actually. They're always sculptures. Okay. Um, so, talking a bit about the fieldwork then. Um, we do fieldwork in a couple of different formations. We do fieldwork in the Hell Creek Formation, so that's classic T-Rex and Triceratops um, from 66 million years ago. And we also do most of our field work in the Judith River Formation, which was deposited about 78 to 76 million years ago. We usually do field work for about three months, depending on how much funding we have available. So usually June to early September-ish. And we do our field work on public lands. Um, so we don't purchase skeletons or anything like that. They're, they cost millions of dollars these days. It's crazy. Um, we, um, we go out and find our own. So let's talk about the Judith River Formation. That's where we were this summer. So here's a picture of what North America looked like 78 million years ago, roughly, when the Judith River Formation started to be deposited. And um, if you know your uh, North America geography, you can see Montana and North Dakota were mostly covered by an ancient seaway, the Western Interior Seaway. So <clears throat> most of the rocks that we're looking at were deposited um, on the edge of an ancient delta that was prograding out into that seaway, just like the Mississippi Delta um, goes out into the Caribbean uh, today. 
Um, so we're in north central Montana, uh, where we're collecting in the Judith River Formation. So here is Montana, and the Judith River Formation is shown in purple. Um, there are correlating rocks in parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan, and also the green Two Medicine Formation you can see in this map. But we work basically all across the top of that purple, uh, more or less along the Canadian border. Um, different places, we work two or three different areas of the Judith uh, to collect in. So usually what we do is we go out and we do a mixture of revisiting old sites that we found in a previous year and prospecting for new sites. Um, so here we are prospecting a little bit um, in one of the areas where we work. So the first site I was going to talk about in terms of digs is a site called Jack's Bone Bed. Um, I talked about this last year as well. Um, in 2020, we, Jack found this, uh, this site. Um, it was a long cliff and uh, sandstone. It's an ancient channel deposit. Um, so it's a channel sand. And sticking out of that channel sand in quite a number of places um, are some large bones and some small bones as well. And these were very intriguing. So that was what we saw in 2020. In order to dig in, we needed to get a permit. So we got a permit and in 2021, we dug in and we started to find some really cool stuff. Um, and then in 2022, this summer, we've been back and we dug an even bigger hole uh, with a permit again. Um, so here you can see a mixture of rubble and uh, people desperately trying to find cool dinosaur bones. And um, some of the area on the left, which has yet to be excavated. <clears throat> This is a little bit later in the excavation, so we dug into the quarry wall quite a bit and we already removed quite a few bones. So what we get at this site, um, it's quite interesting actually. Towards the bottom of the channel, um, we get these really big bones. So this is a picture of a lot of limb bones from hadrosaurs, um, these duck-billed dinosaurs. Um, actually, that's my next slide. Um, and so you can see, I think, two tibiae and a femur in this picture. Um, here's a close-up of two of those bones. So the bottom of the channel, these large limb bones, they sometimes have some small bits mixed in with them, but we get large limb bones, toe bones. We had a few ankylosaur bones, some armor scoots and things, and vertebrae as well from this level. But pretty much everything at this level seems to be quite large. And almost all of the bones that we find at this level are from duckbills, these uh, hadrosaurs they're called. Um, most of what we've seen that we can tell the species of or the group in this area have been from these hadrosaurs that have crests on their heads called lambiosaurs. So we're kind of assuming that most of these big bones belong to lambiosaurs, um, but there are other duckbills in the area at the time, so it's possible that we have some of those bones as well, and we certainly do at other sites. Now, if you go to the middle of this site, you get um, these pebble, these mud pebble channels, um, little gutter casts or lag deposits. Um, no, not gutter casts, forget I said that. Um, these lag deposits. Um, so if you look at these little, little yellow pebbles, um, they wouldn't have been hard pebbles back in uh, dinosaur time. They would have been sort of clay, clay balls, if you like. Uh, we, we call them intraformational mud clasts sometimes, but you get them in channel deposits. Um, so we get these little lenses and these little thin beds of this pebbly stuff uh, around the middle of the site. And what's cool about that is it, it crumbles and it's difficult to work, but you get little bones in it, mostly small stuff. And uh, you can see some uh, pointed out by those blue arrows in the top right of this picture. So mostly those bones, I don't think they're very exciting ones. It looks like part of a vertebra process and a rolled piece. And most of the bone that you get in these little channels is little pebbles of rolled bone. As you might imagine, it's been rattling around a river for many years. It's got all rounded. But every now and then, you get really nice stuff in those, those channels, those little pebbly lags. Um, so this on the left is how this thing was found, um, and on the right is it all cleaned up. It looks very different. Um, this is a claw. Um, it's quite large, actually. This thing's about two or three inches long, so it's probably from a tyrannosaur, I think. Um, but it's a large uh, carnivorous dinosaur claw from those little lag, little pebble lags. Um, this is something we got out of one of those pebble lags um, in 2021. I found this, actually. Um, that's why it doesn't look great. Um, but 
it's just, you can see the bone there pointed out by the blue arrow. It's that sort of chocolate brown stuff. And it doesn't look like much at all, but it is super thin and it's almost see-through. It's almost translucent. And when you get that really glassy looking, very, very thin bone, that's indicative um, that it's something very exciting. And what this actually is, is it's a fragment of wing bones from a pterosaur one of these big flying reptiles. They're not dinosaurs, but they did live alongside the dinosaurs. And pterosaur material is very, very rare. Now, unfortunately, because the bone is so thin, it usually gets damaged very easily. So these pterosaur pieces that we found, there are a couple of other bits like this, you know, they're about an inch or two long. If that's all you get, then so be it. You know, you get a crushed up bit of a pterosaur wing bone. But pterosaur bones are very rare because they're so light and um, hollow and easily destroyed. So it was an indication that there might be more. So we went back this year and we, and we dug some more. And uh, anyway, this is a bone that was found, I think, this year. It could have been last year. But anyway, it was cleaned um, this September by Deanna, one of the new volunteers in the lab. And she was also out in the field with us. And this is a neck vertebra from a pterosaur. So this is what it looks like when it's cleaned up. I don't think I've shown anyone these pictures before. So on the left hand side, you can see that neck vertebra uh, from the top at the top and from the side at the bottom. Um, and it wasn't just this neck vertebra that we had from pterosaurs. Um, we have at least, I think, five other bones and I've got three of them there on the right. Uh, these are small wing bones or finger bones because um, the wing is made of the fingers mostly um, of this pterosaur. Um, it's all from the same roughly the same spot. Um, it's scattered a little bit, so we think it's all from the same individual, um, a small pterosaur. So what is it? Well, we compared that neck vertebra with a neck vertebra from something called an asdarkid. This is a family of pterosaurs that lived in the late Cretaceous mostly. Um, and they're the most common ones, if not the only ones, I think, in the late Cretaceous of North America. Um, now, Pterosaur skeletons, like odd bones, like one or two, like, you know, one bone, like a neck vertebra is quite common. Or maybe not quite common. I'll take that back. Uh, they're rare, but you do find isolated bones from time to time. Um, but finding an associated skeleton of a pterosaur is extremely rare. I think there are only two or three other pterosaur associated skeletons known from Montana. Um, and there's one partial skeleton from the same age rocks in Alberta. They have a few isolated bones, but I think there's only one partial skeleton, maybe two. Um, so we think by making these comparisons, at least to begin with, we've definitely got an asdarkid and it looks very similar to what gets called, or what is called, cryodracon, the, uh, I think it means the frozen dragon, um, from the dinosaur park formation of Alberta. So we might have a second partial skeleton of cryodracon or something very closely related. Our specimen is, is, is small, which is apparently very interesting. So um, the thing about this skeleton is it's, it's very scattered, or well, it's quite scattered through the bed. So we expect it'll be a number of years before we've been confident that we'll have removed everything. So um, it's gonna take a while to, uh, to gather it all up and, and get to the point where we would describe it. But it's a really cool, rare thing and uh, anyone who likes pterosaurs is probably super excited right now um, and if you do like pterosaurs and you're an expert maybe you can tell us what this is um, this looks skull we collected this this summer um, it looks like a skull element it's quite large um, it's very thin struts of bone uh, we think it might be related to this pterosaur <clears throat> but there is another possibility um, and that's that it might be um, a small theropod. Um, on that subject, uh, if you watched this stream last year, you might remember this bone. So this is another bone from the same part of the same bed. And this is a shoulder blade that uh, Curran Mizak found, I think. And uh, here it is cleaned up. This is a slide from last year. And this was some raptor bones that we got out of this site. So there's like a radius on the right hand side. And then there's that shoulder blade that I just showed you on the left. So it's possible that that skull bone is actually from the same thing as this, this raptor. So um, we started cleaning up some more of these bones, or rather Deanna started cleaning up more of these bones. 
uh, these little, little bones, and we found some more of this raptor. So here we go. New bones, 2022, cleaned by Deanna Neff. So these are some of Deanna's uh, specimens that she's been cleaning up. Um, so in the top left, we have a dorsal vertebra. So that's from the middle of the back of a um, one of these little raptors. In the top right, there's a neck vertebra. We actually have two neck vertebrae. Uh, the second one isn't fully clean yet, so I haven't uh, photographed it. Um, you can see there's, there's about a quarter of the top of it is missing, but otherwise it's in very good condition. And we think this one might be from very close up to the skull area. Bottom left, there's a little limb bone. I'm not totally sure that that's raptor. It might be crocodile, but um, maybe. And the bottom right, there's a little finger bone. Um, so we're getting more parts of this raptor. And we, we actually have at least another three or four bones to clean up from this thing. Um, but then we also have this, which is um, the best bone you can find um, of one of these guys. This is a frontal. So this is the bone that sits between the eyes. Uh, we only have one. We have the right hand one. Um, so if, yeah, if you look at that left hand picture, you're looking from the underside. So you can see where part of the brain would be. Um, the frontal lobes, if you're a human. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see uh, what it would look like from the top. So the eye socket is there where the blue arrow is pointing. So the great thing about the frontal is that that's what we call a diagnostic bone. So we can actually tell what species we've got by looking at that bone. Um, we already had looked at the vertebrae and figured that we pretty, were pretty sure what it is that we got, but this, this thing really nailed it for us. So what this is from is what's called a truodontid. So um, these, you know, everything gets called a raptor these days, so I don't think the word really means anything, but uh, I just use it because it's popular. Um, but it, it, this is a, a Deinonychosaurian, um, is it Deinonychosaurian? I don't remember the names of the groups. It's a truodontid anyway, that's the family name. And they have shorter arms than things like uh, Deinonychus. Um, they have very long legs. And they still have that raptor claw on the foot, uh, but it's not quite as big as you see in, in other raptors. Um, and there are very few associated skeletons. Again, you, you get odd bones, um, uncommon, but you do get them every now and then. You know, a claw here, a toe bone there, frontal if you're lucky. But an associated skeleton like this is actually extremely rare. So it's really, really good that we've got, we've got, we've got one. Um, so looking at that frontal, we should have either a genus called Stenonychosaurus or Latinovenatrix. Um, and potentially the specimen could help us understand better the relationships between those two different genera. Stenonychosaurus is known from the lower dinosaur park formation of Alberta, which is probably the same age rocks as uh, that we're digging in. And Latinovenatrix is known from the upper dinosaur park formation, so it probably should be about half a million years younger than um, Stenonychosaurus. Um, so we're not quite sure which one we have, and uh, maybe this new specimen will help us understand the relationships of these truodontids a bit better. So really, really cool. Um, this is so super exciting. Um, every time Deanna was cleaning one of these things up, I was just running into the lab and I was super uh, excited to see what she'd got. So. Um, so anyway, yeah, a really, really cool critter. Um, so between 2021 and 2022, we've pulled about 240 bones out of this site um, so far, and there is many more to come. Um, that's not all though. Uh, Jack's bone bed, um, we mainly were digging it for the lambiosaur um, around the side. So if you've watched these streams before, you might remember in 2020, uh, we talked about uh, this bone. Now, Jack found this sticking out of one side of the site. A little white bit was what was sticking out, and he dug in. And when it's collected and taken back to the lab and cleaned up, <clears throat> it looked like this. So it's the lower jaw of a Lambiosaurine um, we collected in 2020. So we got our excavation permit. We went back. Uh, this is what the jaw looked like. You can't really tell, but um, if you look at the very top of the screen, you can see a sort of brownish square. That's actually the other lower jaw. So we knew that both lower jaws were in the same place. And in fact, the other lower jaw had a beak attached to it. So we were really hopeful there'd be more of the skull at this site. Well, we dug in uh, last year and we found the skull. And we jacketed it and we brought it back to Dickinson. 
And this January, when Steve started uh, working in the lab, I set in this project to clean up this skull. So we flipped over the jacket, opened up the bottom side of it, and Steve started cleaning. And we took one photograph every minute that Steve was cleaning. And uh, yesterday I went through about, me and Liz went through about 15,000 photographs, deleting all the ones where Steve's leaning over the dinosaur, um, and made a time lapse, which I will now hopefully stream successfully. So this is about nine months worth of work. The real video is um, slightly nicer quality than this, but this is running through PowerPoint. I will upload the real video um, afterwards. It only lasts a minute. I'm trying to get it down to less than that. So, uh, yeah, this is um, the complete skull, all cleaned up on one side, um, and it's really quite beautiful. I have to go into the lab and see this every day, it's, it's a real killer. Um, so, we can tell by looking at the shape of the crest um, that this is a dinosaur called Lambiosaurus. Now, there's been some debate as to whether or not there's one or two or three or, or three species of Lambiosaurus. At the bottom of the dinosaur park or the middle of the dinosaur park there's either Lambiosaurus lambii or Lambiosaurus clavianteales. Um, this one looks more similar to what has been called clavianteales, uh, not clear yet uh, until we study it exactly what that means, um, but this is one of the most complete skulls of a Lambiosaurus that's, uh, that's been found. Um, although there are quite a few skulls, I think there's like nine skulls, something like that, from Alberta. But this is the only one from the United States. Um, so we nicknamed it Liberty the Lambiosaurus. Uh, so this is Liberty. Um, we have a partial skeleton to go with it. If you look very closely to the left-hand side, um, you can see there's an articulated neck coming out the back of the skull. Now, when we dug this up in the ground, there were lots of ribs crisscrossing in places, and actually part of the pelvis was lying over the back of the skull. Um, so we didn't see those neck vertebrae when we were digging this thing out, because we tend to go round quite far from the bone. But we, when we went back there this year, we collected more of the neck, we collected um, the shoulder blade, um, there's parts of the arms there, um, sections of tail and vertebrae from the back. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence of the legs or the feet yet, but basically all the other parts of the skeleton are present. Um, so we're hoping that we'll get actually a decent skeleton to go with this skull. Um, so really exciting just from an exhibit perspective. I mean, this is fabulous. This is the only one from the US. If you see a Lambiosaurus like this in another museum, I think they've got one in Chicago um, or the American Museum. Those are from Canada. They're not American. So uh, Liberty is the only American Lambiosaurus so far. Uh, other reasons why, Lambius, uh, why Liberty is interesting um, is where it comes from. So this is a picture of Lambiosaur um, or Hadrosaur, what we call biostratigraphy in Canada. So the ranges in the rock where we get all these different species. And you can see, you can see Lambiosaurus is there, the third column from the left. Um, and there's a bit of a gap. We don't have any Lambiosaurus remains from the bottom of what's called the Dinosaur Park Formation. So could ours fit there? Uh, well, nearby we actually have fossils of a dinosaur called Centrosaurus apertus. I talked a bit about this last year. And we've collected a frill and a, a nose horn from one of these Centrosaurus. So what's cool about Centrosaurus is it evolves so quickly, um, it's only present in a very limited time period. And so if you were up in Alberta, the Centrosaurus apertus zone is like the lower 30 meters of the Dinosaur Park formation. And we get this Centrosaurus apertus occurring a couple of meters below where we got this Lambiosaurus. 
And that basically means that our Lambiosaurus comes from that lower part of the dinosaur park formation equivalent. Um, so it's probably the oldest known Lambiosaurus um, skull, at least. Um, so not only is it the only specimen from the US, it's also the oldest one, uh, we think. So a really cool and uh, quite important specimen um, that I'm sure a few people will be quite excited to read about. Certainly I am, much more interested than those horrible tyrannosaurs, but uh, we'll talk about those in a bit. Um, anyway, <clears throat> really cool specimen, so super pleased that uh, it's cleaning up really nice. And that will hopefully go on display, um, I'd like to say fairly soon, but we have to clean up the other side of it as well. But we will uh, get some of those prep videos up online and perhaps up uh, on exhibit as well. So yeah, Jack's Bone Bed is a super sight. We've not just got the Lambiosaur, we've got a Truodontid and a Pterosaur as well. What more could you want? No Tyrannosaurs in sight. Uh, but that's not all. So um, obviously we go prospecting quite a bit, looking for new sites. Um, so here's a couple of new things. Just occasionally you just get odds and ends, you know, you don't get a full skeleton. So on the left hand side, that is a cheek spike from a, um, a probably a chasmosaurine, or one of these, it's a ceratopsid, a horned dinosaur. So that's one of the spikes from its cheek, just collected off the surface. <clears throat> and then on the right hand side, you might have seen this picture on social media. This is um, a vertebra, I think or possibly, yeah, I think it's a vertebra, um, of a hadrosaur, but it's got these three great big tooth marks. I think there's actually four tooth marks, um, but two of them overlap, um, probably, presumably, from a big tyrannosaur that has uh, scraped the meat off of this bone and uh, dug its teeth into the bone. And part of my research is actually looking at tyrannosaur tooth marks um, on other dinosaurs. So this was a really cool specimen. Oscar found this and he was very excited when he found it. And we haven't cleaned it. This is it just after he found it. it we'd had a bit of rain and so the, the rainwater had washed all the mud off of this bone. So it looked like that just staring up, looking amazing. It was a fabulous thing to find. Uh, here's the mandatory Tyrannosaur tooth slide. That's Amanda's hand on the left hand side. Uh, I think she found five Tyrannosaur teeth in about five minutes. And uh, Mackenzie's found a nice looking Tyrannosaur tooth there on the right. That was from um, a lag uh, bed in what's probably the upper old man formation. And then another Tyrannosaur tooth in the middle. Um, I consider Tyrannosaur teeth to be kind of like the metronome of prospecting. Like they're just sort of ticking, sort of click, tock, tick, tock. And you find one every sort of, I don't know, let's say you find one every two hours, something like that. And if you're finding a Tyrannosaur tooth, for every Tyrannosaur tooth you find, you should find a cool skull bone or a cool little limb bone or something like it's, uh, they, they keep the pace of the collecting going. So uh, we collect quite a lot of Tyrannosaur teeth. Um, where we're prospecting, not for Tyrannosaur teeth, but for other more interesting things, um, Deanna was out prospecting with me and she brought me a little vertebra that she'd found. And it might be the one at the top middle. Let's just say that it was. Um, and I looked at it and it was very small and it had a weird grainy sort of texture on the side. I zoom this picture in so it's a little bit blurred in places, but that middle top one, you can see it. There's some little holes, a little grainy texture on the side of the vertebra. And that's characteristic of uh, juveniles, of babies. Um, these are baby uh, duckbill vertebrae. Uh, the top right one, actually, I think is a phalanx, but the rest of them are vertebrae. Um, and so these are about the right size to be either embryos or hatchlings. So Deanna had found one and I sent her back to the site, and, uh, the spot, and I said, look for more. And she did. She, she brought more back. I think we have about nine, um, which obviously is nowhere near as many as you would get for a whole animal. Um, but there are baby dinosaurs coming out of that spot. And right where those baby bones were coming out was a bunch of eggshell. Now, dinosaur eggshell in itself is not all that rare. Um, you do find it quite commonly in the right formations. Um, but these were large pieces of eggshell. Like you can see on my hand in the bottom left corner, these are like sort of one or two inches across some of these pieces. And they're not just like one flake. It's not just like one corn flake. Um, the picture on the right I've got because there's three layers of eggshell all scrunched on top of each other there. And the way that you get that is that this is, um, this is an egg, you know, this is an egg that's been crushed. It's not just a piece of eggshell that fell in a river and floated along. It's, um, it's a crushed egg. 
So maybe it was a complete egg that got squashed, or maybe the babies hatched and they they trampled um, the remaining eggshell to the bottom of the nest. Um, but there's quite a bit of this eggshell there. And the, we know that there are nesting sites in the local area. So this is a new one. This one hasn't been found before. So it's a new nesting site. So we went through and really got on our hands and knees and scoured the surface. And we found a whole bunch more baby bones. So these are all, the vertebrae are in there, but there's other bones in there as well. Um, the nicest one, I think, uh, is the tibia. So the top right, you can see a close-up of the tibia. I'd like to find the rest of it. It's probably there, but the, the tibia, anyone who works on duck bills will tell you that it's the best bone to find uh, if you want to uh, do histology and look at the growth of a duck bill. Um, although we don't expect to see many growth lines or any growth lines in this one because it's it's an embryo. It, it hasn't had any time to grow really. But um, some really nice, well-preserved bits. We've got parts of a metatarsal. Uh, you can see a little toe bone of, of uh, a phalanx in the bottom right corner. Um, multiple limb bones of different kinds. And I'm sure if we went there and shoveled it out and sieved through the mud, uh, we'd probably find some of the pieces to go with these because they have clean breaks. So there must be middle parts and other ends to go together. So really cool stuff. Um, very exciting. And like I say, embryo hatchling sites are very rare. Uh, so to find a new one is, um, is quite amazing. And uh, I know Deanna was very excited about it. Um, oh, so the, the Big Digs Part 2 um, is a site called Rod's Duck. And uh, at this point, I'd just like to, uh, I suppose, dedicate this part of the talk to Rod Olson, who um, found this site uh, last year. And uh, Rod passed away uh, just a month or so ago. Um, he's, he's been a good friend of the museum for a number of years and has found a number of specimens and donated them. And so... Um, yeah, this is this is his site, and so this one's this one's for Rod. And uh, at this point, I think Liz is going to talk us through the site um, because uh, she was managing the digging while I was uh, off digging up a lot of mud at another site. Uh, I'll introduce it though. Um, ah, okay. Um, so yeah, this is how the site was found when Rod found it in 2021. And um, what you can see on the right hand side is some tail bones. And um, we couldn't dig in any more than that without a permit. So I applied for a permit with the BLM and I, I included this technical diagram uh, explaining what we were expecting to see at the site. So um, I'm a better artist than this. This was just, uh, you know, I'm better with a pencil rather than using my finger on a trackpad, but I promise you. But, um, but so the application was accepted. And uh, we got our excavation permit, but this is what we were expecting to see. So um, a fairly small duck bill. Um, we've got the end of its tail. It's going in. There's not much overburden. It should be a dream of a site to dig. We were very excited about it. Um, so at this point, I will hand you over to Liz. She's going to take the microphone. Uh, yeah, beautiful, uh, beautiful diagram here. I don't know why it looks like an ankylosaur, and is that the head end or tail end? Um, but yes, when initially the uh, initially when we saw the tail uh, coming out, we thought we had quite a small uh, hadrosaur, you know, juvenile, uh, about a year old, maybe a uh, very small individual. As it turned out, it ended up being bigger than that. But, you know, we were hoping to find a perfectly articulated, very small, fairly easy to carry dinosaur. Um, it got a little bigger. So here's a close up of the tail as uh, we followed it in and the tail got bigger as we go. Um, so you can see the string of vertebrae about mid-level on the screen going left to right. and then. Below that, near the paintbrush, those are the chevrons from the lower part of the tail. Uh, and above the center of the vertebrae, uh, the spines on the top of the vertebrae, we haven't excavated yet here because they are still covered with this lattice of tendons. Um, so these fine lines in here, that's the crisscrossing mesh of ossified tendons um, that helps support the tail and help them hold it up straight. Uh, so we started digging in and 
luckily, you know, we weren't sure how much concretion of rock would be around this. Um, luckily, the top surface was pretty easy to clear off, and the hard rock is holding it together from the bottom side. So we continued in, followed the tail, and the tail eventually led us to the pelvis. So that big rock taking up the center top of the screen uh, contains the pelvis in there. So the ilium is in there, uh, presumably the pubis. And what's coming out here that looks like the legs sticking out of the rock, uh, that's actually more of the pelvis, mostly. Uh, so the bones to the left and the right of the paintbrush there are both the ischia, so the, the left and right ischium of the pelvis, and the bone in front there that's very wet with glue right now, um, that is one of the femurs. And Deanna's there cleaning the base of the tail uh, right where it attaches to the hips. So the legs were a little disarticulated, so slightly out of place. Um, we do have the femur roughly where it should be, but then you get to the knee joint and the lower leg is not there. But luckily we did find uh, most of the rest of those bones. So we kept on digging and the upper part and the sides of it are really nice soft sand. It was a beautiful site to dig. Um, it's really just the tail and the pelvis uh, and the rib cage, actually, that are in the very hard rock. Um, otherwise, we were just removing loose, sandy soil. And w one of the cool things we kept coming across were uh, these burrows. This is one of the nicest ones. We had lots of little vertical burrows that we found all around this area. Uh, and then this one, actually, the vertical part connects to a horizontal burrow. So we don't know yet what created that burrow uh, in the past, whether it was an insect um, or some other invertebrate living in the river. Uh, but this, this was a, a river sandstone. Uh, so the skeleton turned out a little bigger than we expected. It went farther into the hill than we expected. So we did have to do some overburden. Luckily, not too much. It was a very small hill. So we only had to take off you know, maybe six feet at most, and most of it was fairly soft. So as overburden goes, compared to other sites we've worked, this was really nice. Um, and you can see us here uh, jacketing a few of the ribs. Uh, in addition to all those insect burrows, we also found uh, various leaves. So there's a really nice, uh, you know, maple type leaf, maple or sycamore, so tulip, something like that, a little multi-lobed leaf. Uh, so once we got away from the main uh, tail, pelvis, rib cage, the bones were a little more spread out, which was really nice for collecting them because it meant you could make nice small jackets of individual bones, which are a lot easier to carry. So here is the map of what we've collected uh, from this summer. There is st probably still a bit more in the ground. And what we're looking at, so to the far right, you have the end of the tail uh, that Rod found going into the low hill. And that tail then leads us to the pelvis that's in this big rock here. There's the femur coming down. And then the rib cage in front of it. And the rib cage is quite interesting. Um, we were really happy to see the rib cage there articulated, but this animal is lying on its right side. So we're looking at the left side of the body. The right side of it was lying on the ground. Its head is towards the left. And what's cool about the rib cage is that all the ribs from the left side of the body that were on top, those got disarticulated and moved. So you can see some of the left ribs that moved away uh, over here. And what's left in this rib block here is actually the, you're looking at the inside of the right rib cage. Uh, so the right side of the body is still all articulated and together. It's the left side that moved around a bit. Uh, and the geology of this site, um, again, it's, it's a river sandstone and the flow of the river was from the right side of the screen, the tip of the tail, towards the left side of the screen 
uh, towards the head because we found a lot of uh, bones that had moved had all moved towards the left. So here's a little tail vertebra that came from the tip of the tail that washed over towards the legs. These are more little bones from the tip of the tail that wash towards the legs. Uh, these are parts of the foot here and here. So the foot wash towards the left. Um, and then we have um, one of every arm bone. So we have a scapula, humerus, uh, radius, and ulna. And we've got the tibia and fibula from the lower leg. So they should be over here attached to the knees, uh, but they got washed towards the left. So the bones do get a little more spread out here, but because the river was carrying things towards the left, towards the direction of the head, we are uh, very hopeful that when we go back next year and we keep digging in that direction, that we will find more bones and hopefully the skull of this guy. Uh, so we don't have the skull yet, so we can't be really sure uh, what species it is, but based on the rest of the bones, uh, including one of the toe bones that has a weird little ridge on the bottom, um, it's probably a Brachylophosaurus or something very closely related to Brachylophosaurus. So it's a duckbill, it's a small duckbill, just not as small as we thought. Um, so, you know, last year we thought it was going to be about one year old. Now, based on the size, it's probably two or three years old uh, when it died. We will know more when we actually cut open that tibia and take a look at the growth rings. Uh, so the tail, pelvis, and rib cage uh, were in that really hard, concreted rock that a lot of the fossils in this area uh, have been in. So we, we and Denver, towards the end, because I had to come back and start teaching for the semester, um, really had a lot of work thinning down those blocks and trying to get them to a movable size. Um, that is really dense, hard rock, and so it's very, very heavy. Uh, so I was gone by the point that they uh, brought it up the hill. Um, so I'll transfer it back to Denver because he had to do the, the hard work that day. Yeah, so um, this rock is incredibly hard and incredibly heavy. And I spent, I think, two or three weeks with a rock saw. Um, sawing it down and chipping it down to try and get it down to size. Um, but eventually we got it down to three jackets. They don't look huge but they're really, really dense, heavy rock. Um, <clears throat> and we had, I think, five or six people dragging those things to the bottom of the cliff, and then they were pulled up the cliff. This was uh, with the assistance of the Bureau of Land Management, so we didn't just uh, drag things around without permission. Um, but that was a hell of a day. But uh, we got it done, and those specimens are now here at the museum. So we have quite a lot of jackets from this site. Uh, this actually isn't a photograph of those jackets, but I thought this is a good point for us to say uh, if you like, uh, if you like dinosaurs, uh, we have quite a lot of things that need cleaning up. So uh, if anybody wants to volunteer to come and clean things in the lab, um, send us a, an email, drop by and uh, say hello. And uh, we've got some cool dinosaur bones to clean up, <clears throat> including quite a lot of things from Rod's Duck. The nice thing about Rod's Duck is it's in this, most of the bones are in this soft sand. So they're actually quite good for um, intermediate projects for people. Um, so we're, we're quite lucky for that. All right, so a little um, a little research recap. Um, so one of the specimens that we had last year, Jack's B2, um, we just had a paper come out on that, um, uh, naming it as a new species called Aspletosaurus wilsoni. So I'm just going to say a couple of things about that. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is uh, we made the headlines of some newspapers. It's the DailyMail.com, everybody's favorite British newspaper. Um, maybe not. Um, so we made the top of the science section, which is quite nice. Um, so this is the site when it was found. That's Jack Wilson standing in front of the site. Uh, if you look in the left-hand side, you can see a little hole in the cliff, a very, very small hole. And that was where he pulled out this premaxilla on the left-hand side. That was the first bone that we found. Uh, so you'll have seen these slides before, perhaps last year or the year before. So we dug in behind where those bones were, on uh, made a, a 20, 24, 25 foot deep hole uh, to try and find some more bones. On the right hand side, you can see Elias, and he was the lead researcher on this project. He described all the bones uh, I was uh, supervising for the most part, although I did take all the photographs. 
Uh, here's the lower jaw beautiful thing that we found when we were quarrying in behind the rest of it. And this is what we had of the skeleton. Not all that much, but we've got um, a decent portion of the skull, including all the best bones that are tell us what species we have, parts of the neck, and a few bits of the tail and a rib, things like that. Um, so based on the shape of certain bones, uh, specifically the display bones around the eye and, and a couple of other pieces, we were able to name this as a new species called Displetosaurus wilsoni, and that was named after Jack Wilson who found it, and it means Wilson's Frightful Reptile. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite important um, as, a, as a dinosaur goes. Um, I'll tell you about, a little bit about that in a minute. Um, as part of the as part of the press for it, we had a couple of nice paintings done. So this one by Andrea Tuchin uh, shows what we think it may have looked like in life. It has a very similar hairline to I, uh, to me. Um, and um, we also had this one done by Rudolf Hema. And this one I, I, I like because it shows four different Tyrannosaurs. And I told Rudolf, we found four in this area. So I'd kind of like to be able to uh, show all four of them somehow getting together. But the they're having a bit of a, a bit of a dispute over a dead dinosaur that they're all trying to eat. So uh, uh, B2, the, or Sisyphus as we call it, is the big one standing in the middle. We have another quite big one that's more fragmentary, and then a couple of smaller ones. So Displetosaurus wilsoni is important because it's a transitional species. Um, it's transitional in form between an older form called Displetosaurus taurosus and a younger form called Displetosaurus horneri. Um, over about um, four million years of time. So this is a good case uh, for what we call linear evolution. I've got a typo there, sorry about that. Uh, linear evolution where um, we don't see branching evolution, we just see one form evolving into the next. Um, we don't see any evidence for overlap between uh, these different species, um, so far at least. And also, uh, Elias's analysis suggested that this group may have actually led to T-Rex, um, which hadn't, hadn't been recently suggested. Um, people had suggested maybe Displetosaurus was a separate branch from the T-Rex branch, but Elias has restored this idea that Displetosaurus actually could be ancestral to T-Rex. So that's proved quite controversial, but there you are. Uh, and... Um, when Andre was making his painting, he made a 3D model to help guide sort of proportions and things at an angle. Um, so we're working with Andre um, and selling these as a fundraiser. If anybody is interested in buying one of these Displetosaurus busts, uh, if you drop me an email, um, I'll tell you about that stuff. And I'm going to make a website for this tomorrow as well on Friday. Um, but uh, they're really nice. Um, we've got our big 3D printer producing these and, and uh, Andre gets a cut and the rest is... Um, goes into paleo funds. So finally, Denver's Tyrannosaur, um, people might remember this one. Um, it was a great big lump of rock that we had helicoptered out of the field last year, finally, and got it into the lab. Uh, this is what we think is inside in the brown, uh, inside that big lump of rock. And well, Steve has started work on the main block now. We've got all the tools going and uh, he started to reveal, this is the very tip of the tail. And our plan is to follow the tail in until it should cross the neck. Um, although the neck might be another four inches down. So Steve's got his work cut out for him there. Um, and uh, we'll see what emerges. But you can see this, you can see this in our public viewing lab now. Um, so you can drop by and see it and see how much progress Steve has made. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to come in every day and see another, another inch of bone. I tell you, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, I always like to finish my talks with a few pictures of some of the different wildlife that we see. So uh, there's a very fancy, uh, fabulous looking caterpillar there on the right. I don't know what species that is, but um, it obviously does, does very well for itself. It's pretty tubby. Um, a hoverfly. Um, no rattlesnakes this year. We saw a few. We didn't get any good photographs. And the top left is one of Liz's favorite pictures uh, from the summer. There's a little mouse that used to live. Uh, next to one of our sites and uh, it used to sit underneath some of our tarps at night and eat, eat its way through all these prairie onions and stuff like that um, and then leave us all these little bits every morning. So uh, that was a cute little picture. Uh, so just a reminder at this point, um, we're going to go on to the live section in a minute or the video section, live section. Uh, but if you want to become a museum member, uh, there's various benefits for doing so, including free admission and uh, discount in the shop. 
Um, so if you live locally, or maybe even if you don't, you could maybe get a, a business, a, a, a membership. Um, for lab or field work, if you like dinosaurs and uh, want to come out and dig, or you can come into the lab and maybe clean some of these things up, uh, we do take volunteers. So you can email me um, or you can email Steve to, to, to volunteer in the lab. Um, but yeah, uh, come and work with us. Uh, we find some cool things and we clean up cool stuff too. Uh, and also consider donating, DickinsonMuseumCenter.com, um, if you like what you see. Um, always very much appreciated. Uh, helps us to run our programming. And a reminder for anyone who lives locally that tomorrow on Friday, December 2nd, is our Christmas open house from 3 to 6 p.m. Um, they've put up a bunch of nice Christmassy style decorations and things, and they have some Christmas stuff next door in the in the, in the Yoakum Museum in history. Uh, so you could come by and see all the nice exhibits there, and also we'll be showing off some of these new fossils that we found. Um, so from 3 to 6 tomorrow, December 2nd, Friday, uh, you can come in for free entry for the museum and see a bunch of these things. Uh, just left to say thank you very much to so many people, um, all sorts of donors, um, the various fossil preparators, volunteers, and Steve, and then people. Um, and then our big field crew uh, for this year, and uh, loads of really great people. Thanks very much to the public land management agencies who uh, give us permits to collect on this land. We really couldn't do it without their help. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to everybody. And now I'm going to switch over to our other camera feed and we'll be able to answer questions people might have and show you some of these fossils and anything and everything else. It'll take about uh, four or five seconds for us to do that. So um, we'll see you in a second. All right, well, we should be filming. So I guess we can all, we can all crowd in and say hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Hey, everyone. I'll go, I'll go and stand behind the camera so we can see stuff. OK. So there's Amanda and Steve and Liz. Uh, hopefully, it should all be working. Um, do we have any questions? Has anyone been, been asking anything? Them, uh, a little bit right along. We've had a lot of questions from uh, Gavin Weaver about um, all of our operations here. Oh, one, one thing I will say to my crew, um, please talk loudly when you're um, on this camera, because this camera, uh, the, the, the microphone is pointing towards me. Gotcha. Yeah. So, um, who's monitoring the feed? Do we have anybody? Uh, well, there's four of us standing here without talking. <laughs> <one. laughs> well, what we could do to begin with is Steve could show us some stuff in the lab if Liz and Amanda want to grab some... Whoops. Yeah, I don't need the battery pack now. I shall grab this. Here we go. All right, Steve, let's go into the lab. Let's go into the lab. Yeah. Here's a forthcoming exhibit. Oh, you saw too much. <laughs> All right. Well, this looks familiar. So you already heard a bit about um, this specimen here. This is Liberty. The first Lambiosaurus from the United States, at least the first Lambiosaurus skull from the United States. Uh, now you can get a few angles of it and see some of the uh, preparation work that's gone into it. The thing about this skull is that it's very frag uh, fragmented. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, fractures that have been uh, propagated through, and that's just how geology works sometimes. Speak up a little bit. It's just how rocks work sometimes. We have a lot of uh, cracks that go through them. So I've been trying to use uh, some different compounds to control those cracks and make sure that uh, the bone is uh, preserved as uh, best as possible. It's very light. It's very spongy. Sometimes in the field, you can just put your finger through it. So uh, we have to use a lot of plastics like a perilloid solution and acetone and uh, Vinax as well. Some of this uh, brightly colored stuff here, that's called uh, propylene glycol. Some people also call it carbowax. I call it Miralax, because it's actually a laxative that can be melted. 
and it helps me stabilize those cracks so things don't fall apart while I'm prepping the specimen. Here's that cool little duckbill right there. What else should we see? Everything. Everything. I forgot to show them the uh, safety. So this is something uh, Diana Neff is working on right now. This belongs to Sisyphus, our Displetosaurus wilsoni specimen. This is the sacrum. It um, goes between the pelvis, and we have at least uh, three uh, centra right here. We have one, two, and a third coming out right here. This is where we start to get into the fun stuff, the really hard concreted sandstone that uh, normal instruments used in uh, fossil prep can't quite uh, touch. So we have special tools for dealing with this. Uh, Zoic Paleotech is a company in the UK. They make some really, really awesome fossil preparation supplies. They have a lot of these concretions in the UK, so uh, they know how to make tools to handle them. This one here. Can you uh, hold the camera for sure. me? Sure, yeah. So this one here is a special air chisel they call their Bronto. This is what I use for what we call bulk matrix removal. And so I know we transition now from uh, the Sisyphus sacrum to this big block here. This is Dunder's Tyranno, uh, our other uh, Tyrannosaur, perhaps a smaller individual of the same species, who knows. And I can do an equipment demonstration, but when I turn on the tool, my voice won't be easy to hear. It's going to be really um, loud. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not through their speakers, but we'll see. Um, I'll do it then. Three, two, one. <laughs> I'm just going to do that real quickly because I want to reiterate PPE, personal protective equipment, is important. When I'm doing this every single day, I'm using anti-vibration gloves so I don't hurt my wrists and need any carpal tunnel surgery or anything like that. Goggles, rock chips fly all over the place. You don't want to get them in your eye, especially with the big guy, this Brano. you got to be wearing them. But then we have uh, even finer air scribes. We have the T-Rex, which is uh, the uh, weaker variety. And this is a small Paleo Tools micro jack. So as you get closer to the bone, you use tools that uh, don't uh, propagate uh, vibrations as well. Um, if uh, you haven't zoomed in on this already, we have one, two, three, four, uh, hopefully about five vertebrae now going in. We're missing some of the chevrons. They probably just floated around here somewhere. The rest of the tail is on display out in our main gallery. So what you can show them the we can show them the whole block. So this is what I usually tell people. This is our Tyrannosaur block. And 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 that for our other one. Okay. Yeah, so this is our whole Tyrannosaur block, and what we've done is essentially dug all the way around this block, and we found where different body parts are sticking out. So based on that, we have we have a limb bone sticking out here. We have the tail, uh, if you can see all the white parts over there, the tail is wrapping all the way around and it's come out from the block. And then over here we have gastralia, which are the belly ribs. And the gastralia have all kind of almost exploded out. So based on this, we think that the rest of the skeletons curled up in here, probably in what we call the death pose. So this is a pose that's typically caused by the flow of water. And we can also confirm that by looking at the surface of the block here. So all these little lumps, we're going to be blasting these away, but these are all clam beds. So these are all little clam burrows. Um, and essentially, this rock has been flipped over. So at one point, the Tyrannosaur was uh, dead on top of the clam bed, and then we flipped this over, and now we're going at it from the underside. And I'll add one little note. When you look at the side of the block here, see where my hands are? This is one of the legs here. And then we got another bit over here. So the legs are hanging out here. Some people think the dinosaur is a little tiny when they look at the rock. It, it is a big rock, but still for something curled up in there might look a little tiny, but we've, we've taken out a lot around this rock. A lot of this specimen was not concreted. It's just the good stuff that is, the back, the head, things like that. Now, based on the way that the gastralia have kind of exploded out, one of the things that we think happened here was essentially this Tyrannosaur was rotting in this, in this pond uh, and eventually had the whole bloat and explosion 
sort of deal happen. So we've collected a lot of those belly ribs, and a lot of them are also very pathologic. They have a lot of injuries on, on the underside of the Tyrannosaur. So that's been pretty cool to look at too. So we had a couple of questions. Um, one question was um, CT scanning the hadrosaur, whether or not we'd see um, like air, air cavities inside, maybe for like trumpeting, that kind of thing. Um, we would like to CT scan that skull. Um, I believe we have that facility at the local hospital if they're interested in uh, CT scanning it. It just depends how wide the CT scanner is. We, if it can accommodate a very large person, then we might be able to get a skull in it. Uh, we'll have to check with the hospital what the width of their scanner is. Uh, Let, let's go into another room where it's a little less heavy. Yeah, sorry. Have a look at this again. Uh, so the question was basically, inside of the crest here has uh, air spaces, uh, which may have been resonating chambers um, for the animal when it was honking, that kind of thing, making noises. So we CT scanned, if we CAT scanned this skull, we might be able to see some of those resonating chambers, that kind of thing. But it's, it is pretty wide. Uh, and so I... I'm not sure the hospital here has a CT scanner able to accommodate something this size. Maybe someone does. Exactly. <laughs> we, you know, could transport it somewhere farther away that has a bigger scanner. Yes, do. We'll figure it out. But yes, I would love to see CT yes. uh, It would be just gorgeous to see what's happening inside the nose. Um, so there are a couple of other questions. Uh, one. One question was just a comment about uh, my email address. You can find the email address on the museum webpage, uh, but it's uh, denver.fowler at dickinsongolf.com. Um, I don't think it was typed in wrong, but maybe it was, but uh, it's, it's on the webpage anyway. If you go to Dickinson Museum Center, you can find it there. Um, what was the other I've also commented my email in, in some of the comments as well. Let's, let's head in this way so we don't get so many echoes. Yeah, so um, another question was, do we intend to um, exhibit uh, Denver's Tirreno in that big block? Uh, and we do, yes. Uh, I think it'd be the death of us all if we actually tried to get the whole thing out of there. We'll, 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 we'll see how that goes. Um, it will definitely have matrix around it. How much matrix, the question is, do I prep it from one side and then flip it over and then prep the other side? Have like a three-dimensional Tyrannosaur on display? Uh, we haven't really seen that before. That'd be cool, but how much of is it there? You know, we don't know yet. We'll find out soon. Yeah, it's uh, in a perfect world. We prep one side, flip it, and prep the other. That should be physically possible. It's going to be really difficult. Uh, I think we'll worry about that in a couple of years or more when that side is clean, and we'll we'll see what there is of it, because yeah. we don't know if the whole thing is in there. We expect it probably is quite complete, but we'll, we don't know for sure. So we'll, we'll plan in a couple of years, that sort of thing. That is a common question I get, and I'll sort of re-answer it here, I suppose. How long is it going to take for me to finish the Tyrannosaur? It's difficult to say at this point. I think two years is... A, a, a good estimate it could be three it just depends we have so many cool things we're finding here my time is also spent on on those and um, just how to navigate something in such a hard rock such a giant concretion it, it hasn't been done often before so those things are, are difficult to get a hand on but i would bet two years maybe two and a half years Cover, cover the basis. I reckon one and a half, two years. <laughs> um, right, so what have we got to show off? What do we want to do? do you want to, we can pull up some of the truodontid bones. Uh, if people want to see that. If you, if you want to see anything in particular, you should comment in the comments. Um, All right. Or we'll just start going through drawers. Oh, this is the 3D print of the Ankylosaurus skull. Yeah, so um, I'm pretty happy with this one. I liked how this turned out. This was a giant puzzle for us. So essentially all of these pieces were cut out in uh, three dimensions, and they all fold over each other. Um, so this is from our big resin printer, and this is just a massive ankylosaurus skull. 
So we tested out a lot of different ways to try and glue the, all this together, and it took a little bit of flexing, and I thought it wouldn't really work out at first. Uh, but it has. So eventually I will paint this, and I'll try to make it look as realistic as possible. But yeah, this thing is kind of heavy. You could grab one of those um, busts from my desk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the 3D printing has been pretty amazing for us to uh, to be able to make new exhibits. You can see some of the new exhibits we're building over there because um, it's all very lightweight and it'll, it'll fit on a frame much more easily. So here Amanda's got one of those Andrea Tuchin busts that um, we're running off at the moment. Yeah, so um, this is an awesome model that was uh, given to us in the process of making that Sisyphus art. So uh, we talked about it with Andrea, Andrea Tuchin and we'll be printing off a lot of these um, and, and selling them. So. If you want to make a donation or if you want one of these, uh, sign up for it. Contact Denver Fowler for it. Or you can always contact Amanda and then I get cut out and I don't have to do all the work. But uh... yeah, <laughs> So um... just a little today thing. We talked about Rod's duck. Well, we do have volunteers actively working on things. And today this specimen was finished by our volunteer, Caleb. This is one of Rod's duck's toes. I just think that's a cool... You know, sneak peek, two-day, look what we did thing. It's really well preserved, too. Yeah, very well preserved. So I'm going to hold up the uh, pterosaur. This is the pterosaur cervical. The focal length on this camera is not amazing. But this is that neck vertebra. And you can see in my hands how small it is. This is not a huge pterosaur by any stretch of the imagination. Um, this is one of the pterosaur wing bones. So they've had a lot of glue, so they're well, they're well glued. This is actually a really nice wing bone. I, I'm not quite sure which one it is because we haven't sat down and tried to figure it out yet. But you can see um, it's got both ends on it. Very often with these um, pterosaur bones, like the original Discovery and then also this one here, this is mostly missing the ends. So they're very, very fragile and the ends get broken off. And that's unfortunate because um, that's quite uh, diagnostic. You can tell what bones you've got uh, better by seeing the ends of the bones. Um, but we've got two pterosaur bones that have got nice articular ends. Look at this one. So this is the end which has the full joint on it, if you like. So we need to, uh, when we get more of this stuff cleaned up, um, it'll be possible to study it and figure out um, what it is. And then there's this bone. And maybe I'll let Amanda hold this. Do you want to hold this? Sure. It's a little... Uh... Yeah. And I can just control the camera. So this is the mystery bone. But maybe if there's someone who's an expert on mystery bones... <laughs> Um, they can they can perhaps identify what this is. Um, we we're pretty sure it's skull. And what do we think it was at first? We thought maybe a prefrontal was it. So this uh, this resembles a prefrontal. And at first I thought perhaps it was an ornithomimid prefrontal. Um, ornithomimids are something that I work on. But the problem is is that this is about four or five times bigger than any other prefrontal I've seen on an ornithomimid, um, including the giant ones from Mongolia. So. This is very confusing. Uh, we would love more opinions on this. I've sent this uh, a, a, some pictures of this to a few different people, but they can't quite tell either. The other thing we might be thinking is potentially pterosaur. So that would kind of fit it in with uh, perhaps having an as dark it or a, a much larger pterosaur. But yeah, um, not entirely sure what this is, but it's really cool looking. Would you like to hold the camera, Steve? I'm going to see if we have any more comments or questions. All right. Yeah, uh, let's fix the yeah. camera on something interesting. Uh, here's some more of these bones again, because I'm standing here. Might as well get one more look at them, huh? Oh, well, what about the frontal? Which frontal? Yeah. Yeah, here. Yeah, so if you get that 3D print. Yeah. So this is our 3D print of Xanabazaar. 
I think so, yeah. This is the model that's on yeah. Sketchfab. So this is a Truodontid. Um, and this is the frontal of the Truodontid that we're digging out. So this is what that would have looked like. So right here you can see the, the orbital rim. That's where the eye would have been. You can see kind of the concavity there. This is a little bit bigger than this guy. So this would be a, a relatively large Truodontid. Yeah, definitely. And back. And here's one of our dorsal vertebrae from uh, most likely the same Truodontid as well. This is really, really well preserved. Um, Dion and F prepped this and she's doing really well with our detailed stuff. So we had a question that what the what was the tyrannosaur doing in the pond or in the river um, before it died or before it was buried, I suppose we should probably say. Um, well, I suppose we don't know. Um, as Amanda was saying, basically, this thing has been transported in a river and it was then washed up in what was probably a shallow pond. So it was probably a, an offshoot channel of the uh, river and it was full of these these um, pond clams, these clams, not pond clams, but quite big, <laughs> quite big ones. Um, we, don't, we don't know what the Tyrannosaur was doing in the river. It could have died in the river. It maybe it was doing a river crossing or for some reason it drowned or whatever. Uh, but equally, it could have been dead on the landscape and then was caught up in floodwaters. So we don't actually know how it ended up um, in the channel deposit like it was. But we can say that it wasn't badly... Um, it wasn't badly rotted um, because it seems to have held together while it was being transported. So it wasn't like a carcass that had been lying on the landscape for months and fallen apart. So it was a relatively freshly dead animal when it ended up in the river. Um, we can say that much. Um, sometimes you can't tell that much about these things. And obviously we haven't cleaned it up yet, or rather Steve hasn't cleaned it up yet. So we don't know all the details that might come out. Maybe it has some tooth marks or something like that on it that we might find out a little bit more of its history. Um, but we'll find that out as we as we clean it up. We do know that it, it burst, that its belly filled with gas and it burst, um, but all of the gastralia, all the belly ribs that fell off, they only moved about um, three feet at most away from the rest of the skeleton, so it didn't move much after it had burst. There could have been some integument, you know, attaching them as well. Right. Some, yeah. Or it could have been very, like, mucky sediment that doesn't allow for uh, quick flow. And I am keeping a lookout for, you know, fossilized soft tissue, scales, things like that. So far, nothing, but it is possible. Yeah. Ooh. Can we look at that in a second? Oh, you were talking about this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is the other neck vertebra of the truodontid. So, um... It was discovered when it basically broke, the piece of rock broke straight through the vertebra. The other half of it is in this rock here. So Deanna is uh, coming back here soon and uh, we'll finish cleaning this up. But um, it's, really, it's really nice. This one's slightly smushed to one side, um, which the other, the other neck vertebra is a little bit smushed as well. But um, really, you know, for these, these raptors are not usually this well preserved. Um, so it, it's very nicely preserved and it's going to be a great study specimen um, when it gets finished. Liz, did you have something? Oh, oh I was just bringing oh, over the rib, the uh, Australia. Yeah. Oh, cool. So yeah. we were talking about the, um, the way that the Tyrannosaur most likely sort of bloated and then burst. Um, these are some of the Gastrelia here. There's, these are some of the belly ribs. Um, and these are two very large pathologies. So this tends to happen after an injury or a break or some kind of bacterial infection. Um, and then the bone coats over the injury over and over again to try and hurt it, or, or heal itself. So this is, this is the way that injuries heal if you don't have a cast. A lot of the gastralia at the very tips show these kinds of injuries. Um, so we're not sure if he was taking a, a beating to the underside, to the belly, or um, my favorite hypothesis is that he was just really bad at sitting down, so he would just plop down pretty hard. Yeah, something like that. And, you know, I'll reiterate, we do have almost, if not all, of the belly ribs they are here. Yeah. This thing is going to be pretty complete. Uh, mostly complete. Yeah, we had a question. Um, 
why does the concretion form, or do we have any idea why the concretion is forming around the sort of central core parts of the Tyrannosaur, but also Rod's duck? So, um, the answer to that, if you feel one of us, <laughs> um, so it's an interesting question. So, why do the concretions form where they do? Um, what I usually tell people when they ask about concretions in the museum is um, that concretions form because there's a chemical difference in the sediment. So you might imagine a bed of sandstone or a bed of sand. Um, so there's occasionally some inclusions or like a little bit of a leaf or something in that sand that makes it chemically different from the surrounding um, typical sand. And that might then basically form a nucleus or a place where other minerals can form around it. So that might explain why we get bones in concretions, but then why aren't all the bones in concretions? Why is it just the core middle part of the body? And it has been suggested that the presence of flesh or bits of meat, you know, organs um, on the skeleton may actually um, help cause the concretion to form. Whether it's bacteria helping with the rotting of the flesh um, that actually help form the minerals, or whether they basically create a microclimate around the fossil, uh, which is chemically different from the surrounding sediment, that then encourages the formation of the concretion. Um, there's a few different ways of looking at it. I don't know if uh, people are familiar with what's called a dipocia, um, which is probably not, it could be in, the, in these cases. A dipocia is, is a fatty wax-like substance that if you bury a body, uh, which we all do all the time, of course, yeah. um, in a very wet, sort of anoxic, oxygen-poor environment. Um, the fleshy parts of the body can turn into this fatty wax, which apparently really smells very bad indeed. Um, and I, I, believe, I read an article, I think, about them digging up mummies or digging up bodies in Mexico because they ran out of space in a, in a uh, graveyard or something or other. And they dug these bodies up and they looked perfect, you know, but then they really smelled bad. And there's a whole rhino made of this stuff as well that someone dug up on a university campus. But what's interesting about it is that then basically it, it, it surrounds the bones in this chemical that's different. And that can encourage or mediate um, the um, formation of um, concretions and things like that. And sometimes we think that similar processes may have helped cause muscle fibers to be preserved in really exceptional fossils or even feathers and things like that. So there's, um, it's quite interesting that there's some of the new research that's being done on how um, organic parts of the body, well they're all organic aren't they, but the, the fleshy parts or the soft parts of the body can actually help fossilization or become fossilized themselves. There's quite a few people working on lots of different aspects of that. So do we have many other questions? Do we have many people still watching? What have we got? All right, we'll show more fossils. What have we got? Liz, do you have some fossils? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, Let's well, I'm it. a hadrosaur person, yeah. right? So, um, this is from one of our own beds, and it is just a beast of a That's toe beefy. bone, okay? This is uh, the middle toe bone from the foot of a, a hadrosaur, a duck billed dinosaur. And it's huge. It's it's gigantic. This is six inches across. This is one of the largest uh, hadrosaur toe bones I've ever seen. And we're not even in the Hell Creek formation. Like, at Montosaurus, sure, this would be fine. But in the Judith River formation, this is a big duck bill. This is really huge. And I love the end of it here. Uh, you have this exquisite preservation, all these little pits here. Um, would be where the articular cartilage was covering the surface. There was a really interesting poster at the of SVP paleontology meeting uh, about a month ago. Um, just really gorgeous detail. Because all of our, our bones, our long bones, the joint surfaces are covered with cartilage. And so this is evidence of that cartilage. Here. Now, I have been asked before, like, what are the chances that it's, it's just a small hadrosaur with just a giant foot? <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, that would on. be really weird looking. Yeah. Uh, anything's possible, sure, but uh, that would be pretty funny looking. Yeah. 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 It's just, uh, yeah, that is big. It's really big. I love that. And, you know, 
requisite Tyrannosaur tooth. I mean, look at the size of the Tyrannosaur tooth compared to the toe bone. I got something cool over here. Okay. So we have shown some of this stuff before, um, but one of these is new. So these are some of the bones of Jack's B2. So this is, these are the two most diagnostic bones for certain things. So where my little finger is wiggling is where the eye would be. This is the post-orbital. This is the lacrimal. So the bump that you can see here is the lacrimal horn. And you can see the bump here on the post-orbital. Um, yeah, is the little post-orbital horns. And I can only hold two bones at a time. So that's how those two go together. The lacrimal was one of the first bones to be found. And we couldn't tell what it was. I, I, um, I just went round it, jacketed it properly, flipped it over, and it's like, whoa, this is a lacrimal. When we flipped it, it was amazing. There's the squamosal and the post-orbital slotted together as they would be in life. So, again, my little... Well, you probably can't see my finger wiggling. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. But uh, that's how the back of the skull fits together. Now I'm going to show you something that no one's seen before. Oh, yeah, that guy. So this is another Tyrannosaur. This is... Uh, Jack uh, from Jack's Tyranno. So my thumb is pointing at B2 and then this one here is, a, is another Tyrannosaur. You can see it, they're both, they're two left post orbitals. Uh, this is a slightly smaller individual than this one. Uh, only just uh, there's a few similarities and differences and it's something we're going to be digging up uh, a little bit more of uh, hopefully next summer. Uh, but you can see we have it to compare with Jack's B2. So it was already cool that we had uh, B2's post-orbital, but we have another specimen as well, um, which has a beautiful post-orbital to go with it. So we're hoping there'll be a bit more of that. There are sinkholes around where this thing came out, and also um, a lot of it had already blown out of the cliff. So we have a few other fragmentary bones of the skull, um, but we're hoping to get some more nice ones. This one just happened to be fairly close to the edge of the cliff where we started digging in this summer so it's really pretty really nice so there's uh side by side hope alias is all right with me showing those but uh if you tune in you get to see some exclusives i figure out how it goes back in this thing there it goes there we go what else we got hmm? Dinosaurs, dinosaurs. Pull out some, pull out some yeah. teeth. Pull out some teeth. Yeah. Lots of dinosaurs to clean. Once again, call for volunteers. Yes. This is all uh, dirt that needs to be moved, literally. All of those jackets have to go. Yes. We want to get all of them grabbed. We need we need all these things cleaned up by the end of the spring because yeah. next summer we're going to go make more. Yep. Um, oh, and there's so. those too. And and there's more. There's, there's those. More. Oh, and I, I almost oh, forget yeah, there's yeah, some there's behind more. me And there. then there's some in the other building. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, you don't even know about the other building. That's right. <laughs> A lot of work to do. Yeah. All right, still streaming. Um, does anybody want to check on questions? If we have uh, uh, one or two more questions. Nothing lately, but we will take special requests if mm. uh, there's anything in particular you're just dying to see. Can we grab a baby bone? Oh, yeah. Stuff? yeah, show the baby bones. Yeah, I don't get Deanna's stuff. You gotta show some of these. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, someone asks, uh, I heard you find a lot of Tyrannosaur teeth. Are these diagnostic? Uh, they are Tyrannosaur teeth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, so, just having a Tyrannosaur tooth, right? Uh, there's one. We've got them all over the place. So, we know it's from a very large meat-eating dinosaur. Um, and really the only thing that big is a Tyrannosaur. So again, not T-Rex, but one of the ancestors. Um, and yeah, not really. I mean, we can tell the size of the individual. Um, we can tell where in the mouth this tooth would have come from. Uh, this one is fairly three-dimensional, if you can see the bottom side there. Um, so this one's a little more round, so probably a little more towards the front of the jaws. Um, it has a beautiful little wear facet here. You can 
can tell the shine of it is slightly different. So this is where the teeth, one tooth was grinding against another. Um, so there's lots of things we can learn from the teeth, but they don't really change species to species. So we don't know, we can't say for sure if this is Dyspletosaurus wilsoni or Gorgosaurus or or anything. Um, Some people have claimed in the past that you can tell the difference between the two, but right. as far as um, I've seen and as far as my uh, Tyrannosaur re researcher friends have seen, there is no difference at all. Right. And Liz Flynn, if you're if you're watching, um, this was that uh, tooth you found in a million pieces that you thought had no hope and you're sad about. And yes. look at it right now. It's a great educational It's tool. true. It, it does say on the collection label, uh, Liz's sad broken, broken tooth. tooth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, how far it's come. Yes. Yeah, it came in. It looks nice. It's a beautiful little tooth. Uh, but yeah, we've got loads. So right. this is Deanna's uh, baby, the, uh, her hatchling site. These are a few different bags full of embryonic bones, um, hatchling bones, and eggshell. Here, I'll pull out the eggshells. We have the best baby stuff in this bag. Okay. So this is some of that eggshell here that has multiple layers to it. You can see there's there's a few different lines running through this of eggshell, and it's all been fragmented up, but this is a uh, part of a crushed egg. So we'll be looking into this a little bit more. Uh, all of us here are really excited about this stuff and potentially researching it. There's a lot of reading to do about eggs, yeah. that's for sure. Uh, so these are just some of the baby bones from the site. So these are just adorable little vertebrae here. Very skinny bone here might be part of a hand or a very tiny radius from the arm. It's broken in half. Uh, and then this is the tibia, the shin bone. And so this is just the, uh, the knee joint up here. And then the rest of the bone in total would be about that long if we had the whole thing. Um, we don't, but we do have enough that uh, we could study the growth in here. And like Denver said, I mean, obviously this is a very small individual. It's not going to have annual growth rings because it's way too young. But we could possibly learn about how it grew inside the egg um, and possibly look for indications of hatching and see if these bones are from uh, an embryo that was still inside the egg or if this was a nestling that had recently hatched uh, and was still living close to the nest. Um, so that is something that we can do with a tibia, which is why we love finding tibiae. All right. Um, we had a few more questions. One person asked a little while ago if it was possible to buy 3D prints of um, fossils. Um, we, we're starting to make our own 3D models of um, um, some of the fossils we have in our collection. Um, we do plan on making a full reconstruction of the Sisyphus, the B2 skull, and that project is starting soon, so we'll probably make that available when we do so. Um, but as I think um, we'll see how this sort, of, this sort of bust sale goes, and then just sort of we might be selling 3D prints of different things from our collections. It certainly sounds pretty cool. Um, the main challenge is getting a really good scan, so, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll think about that. Um, I think somebody else asked, um, are you illegally allowed to collect just off the surface? On public lands, vertebrate fossils, no. You can collect fossilized wood and you can collect invertebrate fossils like clams and shells um, off the land surface. Um, you can collect a limited amount of fossilized wood. I think it's like... 25 pounds plus one piece. 25 pounds plus one piece per year. But vertebrate fossils, you have to, um, you have to leave them and they have to be collected under permit even just off the surface. So um, we have permits to do all that. Um, we had another question. Question about, uh, do we find fish, bugs, or plants? Do we find fish, bugs, or plants? Um, I've not found any insect fossils. We do have some really cool burrows from a couple of our sites. Liz showed you one during the talk. Um, and we got a really good one last year. It's a multi-chambered brood burrow of a, of a wasp or something. Uh, so if you watch last year's field presentation on our website, you'll be able to see some photographs of that. It's not cleaned up yet. This is the leaf, um, which I have mixed feelings about because um, 
it's in a really hard piece of concretion. You can see some saw marks on the side. Yeah. Um, but I was sawing off and I cracked this great big lump off and uh, there's a nice leaf in it, but I was I was hating on this rock a lot when I was cutting it. <laughs> it was yeah. uh, it uh, was just constant stress for three weeks. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times leaf fossils are found in uh, very flat sediments, so flat layers that were deposited in a calm environment. Uh, but at this this leaf and also ones that we find at one of our bone beds, you can see it's curved. So we're getting three dimensional leaf preservation that tells us some, it's, it's interesting to think about how this river channel uh, was deposited, that it was not laying leaves down flat. There was topography and shape to the sand uh, that was bending these leaves as it was preserved. So. I was just thinking, we haven't tried this leaf under UV. Ooh, yeah, that'd be cool. And one thing we know about the Judith River fossils is the teeth glow under UV. They glow red. Okay, I'm going to find something else. Uh, which is pretty cool. I got something else over here. So, this is the quadratajugal of B2. And this is a baby quadratajugal from uh, very close to B2, probably the same stratigraphic horizon, but about a quarter mile away. Uh, it's the mirror, it's the mirror. So this is a, a right and this is a left, but you can see this, this individual is quite a lot smaller than B2, Sisyphus. So I think uh, Elias is gonna be describing this specimen at some point in the future, uh, possibly when he gets around to describing the postcranial material we have at B2. But uh, left. A lot of these random bits of tyrannosaurs, as well as these uh, skulls and skeletons. Okay. Any Good other stuff. questions? Any questions online? I've probably been on for about half an hour. Yeah. If there's any other questions, we'll answer those, otherwise maybe we'll wrap up. Walk into the lab one more time. Here's one more look at our precious here. It's so beautiful. You thought Sisyphus was cool. You didn't know what you were missing. Yeah, the the picture that Denver showed earlier in the presentation made the crest look a little small just because of the angle of the camera, uh, but it is uh, a fairly large crest. It's just absolutely gorgeous uh, with this little prong coming off the back. And yeah. just, this is so pretty. It has been an honor to prep. That's much I, <laughs> it's, it makes me speechless, honestly. And yet... When you're collecting this thing in the field, it's a real pain because the rock likes to break through the bone. So you have to be really trenched carefully more than usual. It's, it's really difficult to deal with. Um, well, it's not really difficult to deal with, but it helps if you have an air chisel out in the field with you um, to go around the bone. This, that's definitely true. Air scribes in the field on this site, I'm 100% on board, made me a believer. The rest of the skeleton in the field is all stacked together like a Jenga tower, so it's really hard to get through otherwise. Here's another angle at Denver's Tyranno, our Pistatonic Tyrannosaur. And I'm saying that really quietly, I'll try loudly. Here's another angle at Denver's Tyranno, our Pistatonic Tyrannosaur. So a Pistatonic refers to the death pose. So that's the, um, the whole curled up pattern there in formation. Yeah. So we showed this off in the talk a little bit, but this is the death pose here, this sort of curling backwards of the head towards the tail. Now, for a long time, uh, people weren't exactly sure why this kind of pose uh, would form. They thought maybe all of these animals were dying in, in great pain and they were throwing themselves back, uh, but really it's just water flow. So, and now we've tested this. Yeah, and coming in two years, maybe you'll see the whole whole picture form. And if you stop by our museum and look in the uh, gallery in the sand pit, you'll see the rest of the tail. I mean, I've got almost the whole tail fully prepped. It, it clicks onto the block here. This is where the ilium is. And it clicks right here where the tip is. And I don't have more than four or five verts to go here. It'll probably end up ending up right there. But there's my suite of tools again. Ooh. 
something different, the T-Rex, the Bronto, the Micro Jack. Your PPE, very important. China bristle brushes, these are perfect. They don't uh, wear down very easy. And when they do wear down, they wear down evenly. So I could be missing an inch off of it. You wouldn't even know. It's the little things in life. Well, I think we're gonna finish up pretty soon. Um, someone asked if we had any mammal material. Um, we have collected some mammal material from the Cretaceous. Um, we don't have all that much that's, that's really immediately accessible. We have quite a lot of rhino material on display um, from about 30 million years ago. Uh, but I thought I'd show you this, since this was something that's quite new that I haven't shown before, I don't think. Um, this is something that we saw poking out of the uh, jack saw, poking out of one of the microsites. But there was a nice claw, and we could just see this crisscrossy um, bit. And we thought, well, that looks like skull. So this got cleaned up not long ago, and it's actually most of um, the upper part of a turtle skull. So here's the little turtle beak, and then this is the back of the skull. So I posted some pictures of this to social media, but it's a cute little turtle skull. So we have another partial turtle skull that's being studied by some of our friends down in Arizona. Um, and I think that, that one, that's the one that's got a really beautiful ear bone preserved. But this one uh, doesn't have any ear bones, I don't think, but uh, another nice specimen. All right. So otherwise, um, unless anyone has anything else to add, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is going to be this is going to be moved on to YouTube, so you'll be able to watch it again on YouTube if you so wish. Um, and, uh, and also you'll be able to catch it on our local Channel 19, we'll be streaming probably through the year. Um, otherwise, thanks very much. Uh, keep watching our Facebook page because we're always posting updates and Steve is revealing new things every day. And uh, Amanda's cataloging new things every day. And scanning. And scanning new things every day. So um, there's always something cool going on. I know that's why I come into work every day. So, uh, cool. Uh, thanks very much again, and uh, drop by the museum. Remember, tomorrow is um, our open uh, free day, so from 3 to 6 p.m. you can come in and see some of the nice Christmas exhibits next door, or see some of these fossils as well. All right, thanks very much, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.